Good evening, everyone. Grab your hymn books. Hymn number 162. Let's all stand and sing. To God be the glory, great things he has done. Hymn number 162. Great things he hath done, so loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord. second verse. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer, the promise of God, the vilest defender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon received. Praise the Lord. Good to see you all back in the Lord's house. Let's have a word of prayer as we get started uh, this evening. Brother Andrew, if you would, sir, please lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I'm thankful this night, Lord, because I don't know how house to know more about you, and please be with anyone else who might be dabbling in, and please be for the message tonight. Please have us knowing something from it. We're going to buy for our knives. In Jesus' name I beg, amen. 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 Thank you, Brother Andrew. Please be seated. Well, amen. It's good to be back, and uh, Brother Smith's going to be preaching again this evening. Looking forward to hearing uh, from the Word of God tonight. And we are, uh, of course, gearing up for our uh, church's annual cookout uh, the last uh, f uh, last Saturday in, in the month. It's uh, 29th, and so hope you'll come and join us. It's going to be a pig roast this year, and looking forward to that. We have never done this before and we're going to be renting a very large roaster so that the pig can stay uh, half intact. It's a half a pig, and uh, we'll be putting it on that big old grill. Looking forward to seeing that. Um, Sister Lydia, they saved the head. They did. And so uh, it's there, just, just one. Uh, but, um, you know, um, I just wanted to let you know it's, it's, it's ready for it. Uh, and I asked him, I said, are the brain still in there? And he said, oh, yeah. So if, you, you know, if anybody likes uh, pig brain head, pig brains, uh, we'll have some of that for save an apple. Save an apple. Yeah, it's going to be fun. So uh, anyway, we got, a, we got a half a pig we'll be throwing on the grill and, uh, and a head just laying on the table. That's going to be fun. 
But uh, looking forward to that. So uh, there'll be a lot, a lot of pork uh, coming up on the 29th. Uh, there'll be some other things that we're going to need. So please uh, take a look out uh, when the sign-up sheet comes out and see what you can do to help out with bringing some food in for that night. But uh, we'll start at 4 o'clock and go all night long. Uh, enjoy it. Uh, Brother Denny doesn't mind folks camping in his backyard. So uh, we'll have to wake you up early for church the next day. But come on out and join us. Invite some folks out. We'll just have a great time of fellowship as we celebrate our church's anniversary here in the month of October. It'll be a blessing to have you there. Uh, other than that, that's all the announcements I have. We're going to go over our Bible verse uh, for the month. And uh, I want to say happy anniversary to a young couple, Tyler and Natalie. Today, unless you, unless, unless you don't know this, today is Tyler and Natalie, at, I know that of days, Tyler and Natalie's one-year anniversary Congratulations, guys. What a, a wonderful, wonderful day, way to spend your anniversary. So um, make sure you extend the, uh, your salutations to them uh, throughout the day. But Lord bless you guys. And uh, um, it's, it's wonderful to be able to share uh, this day with you here in the Lord's house. Happy anniversary, guys. All right, Brother Stephen, shall we? All righty. Pins are on the way. So uh, would you still recite your verse, right? IOU list is, is getting big. Jeremiah 24. If you go with me there, Jeremiah chapter 24, verse number 7, we've been looking at. Jeremiah 24, verse 7. And if you're there, you can read that nice and loud with me. It says, and I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. It's Jeremiah 27, 4. Anybody working on that this afternoon wants to give that a go tonight, you can go right ahead. No, still working on it. All right. All good. Tom? Okay, grab your hymn books. 147. Let's all stand. We'll sing. What a fellowship. Leaning on leaning on the everlasting arms. What I meant to say. 147. What a fellowship. What a joy. Thank you for being here tonight. Looking forward to the preaching. Brother Smith, you ready? Oh, amen. Let's have the Word of God preached tonight. So, brother, <laughs> thank you. Amen. Glad I'm ready. 
<laughs> good to see you tonight. Appreciate you being back in the Lord's house. Hope you had a good afternoon. Hope you got a nap in. And if you didn't, don't take it during the service. <laughs> but afterwards, good to see you. We're going to be in John's, the Gospel of John tonight. And uh, just while you're turning there, John chapter 17, I'll just mention, um, the pastor mentioned we have some books out there, a couple of devotional books. Each one has 365 devotions, one for every day of the year. And, uh, and in the back, they're all uh, actually uh, categorized by, verse, by the chapter, the verse, the book of the Bible. So you can always research them that way. It's a, kind of a good way to look up a passage. But also, I uh, mentioned that the, we, our church has been publishing a, a paper several times a year called The Flaming Torch. It's not original with us. Another pastor or evangelist had it for about 60 years, and he passed away, and his pastor uh, asked us to consider taking it on. So for a few years, our church has been publishing that, and there's some copies of that. They're free. Just pick those up. If you don't have one, if you've never seen it, feel free just articles from people of like faith and practice. We don't have what I would say a lot. We don't have necessarily nationally known people. We don't have, you know, these big names, but just people that are faithful to the Word of God and faithful to Bible doctrine, which is Baptist doctrine. And uh, so I think you'll find some encouragement from that. And if you wanted to subscribe to it, there's a way that you can subscribe to it and get it to come into your home. But anyway, and, in a, and I, there's maybe one copy left of that church book, a book just about the doctrine of the church, an entire book that uh, several other pastors and myself put together a few years ago. And uh, so anyway, it's, it's, it's good to have a book about the church from the biblical point of view of the church, which is local, visible assembly. And so I know this church would agree with that. So anyway, I appreciate the opportunity to bring books along. And so if we can help you with that, let us know. And we're going to be in uh, John chapter 17. And we're going to look at this prayer that Jesus prayed, but from a kind of a different perspective, uh, maybe than you've looked at it before and hopefully appreciate uh, the, f the things that he specifically requested uh, for his followers. John chapter 17. I'm going to read a few verses before we pray. In verse 1 it says, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. And then in verse 9, Jesus continues his prayer saying, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me for they are thine. And then if you look in verse 13, And now come I to thee, the prayer continues, Jesus praying, And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which should believe on me through their word, that they all may be one. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know 
that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be, where I, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. It's a very special prayer, is it not? Just a wonderful record that the God has given us of this prayer that Jesus prayed. And let's pray as we study it together, all right? Father, as we pray tonight, we certainly need your help. We ask you, Lord, to open our eyes that we might behold wondrous things out of thy law. Lord, we are grateful tonight to be able to assemble in this place. We're grateful for this church, for its history, for its influence, for its ministry here in this region. We thank you for Pastor Shorter and his family. And Father, we pray tonight that as we get into the Scripture that we could, Lord, learn about you, learn more about our walk with you. And Father, as we think about this prayer, really a holy moment, that this prayer that was prayed, that Lord, we might be a part of seeing this prayer answered for your glory and honor. And we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we get into this prayer tonight, we don't want to begin by just, just noticing a few things to me that just underscore the significance of it. And of course, the first thing is when you consider who was praying, this was Jesus praying. He prayed for specific things. And you know, when I think about prayer, I think about my own prayer life. I think about prayer in general. And it's, it's, it's a reality that sometimes I might pray for things that maybe aren't even God's will. I pray for things maybe that I want that God may not want. I may pray for things to happen at a certain time that God may choose not to let them happen at that time. But one thing we can be certain of, and that is this. If Jesus prayed for something, it is God's will. If Jesus prayed for it to be done, we can be confident that it should be done. God wants it to be done. So we think about this prayer that Jesus prayed. And just, just imagine when I read this, I don't just try to think about it historically as a record of a prayer that Jesus prayed for me. But I like to think about it personally, that this is something that Jesus prayed for us tonight, for his people. So it's, it's important when you think about the significance of who prayed it. And then when you think about when it was prayed, it would be a wonderful prayer whenever it was prayed. But in the setting, if you think about it, you know, John chapter 13, we have Jesus meeting with the disciples and washing the disciples' feet and teaching them valuable lessons. In John chapter 14, we have Jesus teaching about the coming of the Holy Spirit and, and also about His going into heaven. You know, uh, I go to prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I would have told you. I, I want to bring you where I am myself. John chapter 15, He gives us that Great lesson about bearing fruit, and then I'm the true vine, my father's the husbandman, and I want you to bear fruit. And then John chapter 15, John chapter 16, we have again the teaching about the Holy Spirit. It's expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Spirit of God will not come. And then we have this prayer in John 17. And in John 18, we have Jesus going to the Garden of Gethsemane where he would agonize in prayer for us and sweat, as it were, Luke says, great drops of blood, and pray and intercede for us and go to the cross for us. So sandwiched in between all these teachings and going to the cross, we have Jesus praying this prayer. So it's, it's really significant when you think about it. I have to, you know, I can't compare myself with Jesus. Obviously, none of us could. But I, if, I, if, if I were Jesus and I was about to go to the cross... I can't see myself interceding for other people. You know what I'm saying? I'd be thinking about what I'm going to. I'm thinking about what's about to happen to me. But in that moment, Jesus is praying for a special group of people. And so you think about who prayed it. You think about when it was prayed. And then you think about who he was praying for, because that makes it so special. In verse 9, Jesus said, I pray for them. 
In verse 9, he also said, I pray not for the world. He wasn't praying this prayer for everybody. He was praying this prayer for a select group of people. And that group of people, of course, were his followers. If you look in verse 20, he says, Neither I pray for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me. Those that follow will believe on me through their testimony, through their word. So he's praying this prayer for every believer. Now, if you're a believer... If you're a child of God, if you've been born again, Jesus was praying this prayer for you. He was praying this prayer for you. You say, well, I wasn't even born then. No, but he said, I'm going to pray for not only for you, but for those who will believe on me through your testimony. And so what he prayed, he prayed this for us. Now, in a, in a very general way, I can, I can say with confidence that Jesus prayed this prayer for every believer. But in a more specific way, I think about who this was that was assembled with him in John chapter 17 when he prayed. And it wasn't just, it wasn't just a group of believers, that's important, but it really was the church that he established during his earthly ministry. He was praying this with the members of the church. He was praying this for his church. So so generally, I could say that Jesus prayed this prayer for every believer in this room. But more specifically, I can say with confidence that he prayed this prayer for his churches. This is what he prayed for, for his churches, particularly for his churches. And so as I look at this prayer, I just see some important things that Jesus wanted to be present in our lives. And some things that he wanted to be present in his churches. So we're going to look at it from that point of view. And it's, it's just as relevant if you think about it in terms of churches or individual Christians, because it's true either way. But, but I like to think of it in terms of churches. I like to think he was praying this for Mount Zion Baptist Church, where I pastored for many years. And he prayed this for New Testament Baptist Church here in, in Columbus. We were talking about titling sermons today uh, at lunch. And so if I was titling the sermon... I would, I would title it this, The Church That Jesus Prayed For. This is what Jesus prayed for in His churches. And so let's look at this. We can't look at everything in this text that, that maybe we might look at, but I want to look at some things that I think are very important. So let's begin just going through this passage and look at what Jesus prayed for, for you and for me and for His churches. Look in verse 13, He says, Jesus says, He's talking to His Father. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. So just simply reading that, something's very clear to me, and that is this. Jesus prayed that we would have joy. Isn't that a wonderful thing? I think it's very important. I, I, I really think it's very important when you think about... Um, us as believers and the way we live our lives and, and what other people see in us. You know, I, don't, I know you can't always judge any people by what's on the exterior. I thank God for the uh, admonition uh, in the Old Testament in the book of uh, Jeremiah when he says, don't look at, the, don't look at the, their faces lest I confound them before you. Because you can't always tell by looking at people's faces if they're really happy or really sad. But just for the record, Jesus prayed that we would have joy. Aren't you glad about that? And I think that's important because, you know, I spent, I, regrettably, I spent several years of my life uh, living in sin and thinking that maybe there was a better life out there, a more joyful life, you know, outside of church, outside of serving God, things of that nature, and before I was really born again. But, but you know, a lot of people have this idea that cr the Christian life can't be any en enjoyable. But I want to tell you, Jesus prayed that you would have joy. Now, the joy of Jesus is not like the joy of the world. It's not like, you know, when you always get your way or you win the lottery or, you know, your team always wins, especially if you're from, apparently from Philadelphia. But <laughs> it's a good thing that I'm, that I'm not a baseball fan because I would be upset with Philadelphia for what they did to the Cardinals, but I'm not. But our joy is different. 
Our joy is different from the world. It's not just an emotional joy. I don't think church should just be an emotional experience. Sometimes people go to church just thinking it's some, supposed to be some kind of an emotional high, or they shop for churches so they can find one that makes them happy. I don't think it's that kind of surface joy that Jesus is talking about, but, I'm, but I believe the joy that He's talking about comes from knowing Him. It comes from fellowshipping with Him. As a matter of fact, and we're not going to turn to this, but I want to read you just two verses of Scripture from one of the epistles of John. And he says this, John the Beloved, the same writer who recorded the Gospel of John, said, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us, And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. You know, the most meaningful life ought to be the life that's lived in fellowship with Jesus Christ. Jesus prayed that we would have joy. Joy comes from knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. Satan, young person, Satan wants you to believe the opposite. He wants you to believe that there's some kind of life outside of God, outside of the church, outside of the will of God that can be, it's more joyable. But I'm telling you, you know, this is, this is the life that Jesus wants us to live. And he, he prayed for us to have joy. There's, there's joy not only in knowing the Lord, but in serving the Lord. I mentioned that passage, we're not going to turn to it, in John chapter 13, where Jesus was washing the disciples' feet. I love that passage. I love to read about it, think about it. And it's not, it's not something that's really would appeal to most people, especially men, to wash a bunch of this dirty feet of, of men. But, but Jesus said this. He said, I do this for an example. Jesus, you know, you, you might or I might or somebody might think, well, I'm just too good to do something like that. Well, Jesus wasn't too good to do something like that. And then Jesus, what he said, he said, if you know these things, happier are you if you do them. If you learn to serve others, you'll find that there's joy. And he said, happy, happiness in serving other people. There's, there's joy to be found. And Jesus prayed that we would have joy. You know, like I said earlier, the churches are kind of, in our, in our generation, they're looking for some advantage to entertain people to make them happy. But that's not really where happiness is. Happiness is in knowing the Lord and serving the Lord. And, and, and sometimes, let's be honest about it, sometimes as Christians, we don't have the joy that we think we should have or we want to have. And really, it's possible, you know, for us to lose our joy. You know, uh, David said in that psalm, you know, over in Psalm 51, after he committed this horrible sin with Bathsheba, he said, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. And sometimes sin causes us to lose our joy. See, I, I've known people that, you know, you can almost tell on their countenance that something's not right in their life spiritually. And because sin robs us of that joy, God can't, if you're saved, if you're saved, Satan can't steal your salvation if you're truly born again, but he can steal your joy and he wants to do that. And so there's joy really in knowing that we're right with God. Matter of fact, let me I'll give me a little fill in the blank. You know, in Galatians chapter 5, it talks about the fruit of the flesh and it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. And it says this, the fruit of the Spirit is love, what? Joy. Joy is the fruit of the Spirit of God living in our life. Now see, you just ask yourself tonight sitting here, do I have that joy in my life? Do I, it, can I say my Christian life is a joyful life? And if we say no then I want to encourage you to say this, to tell you this, Jesus prayed that you would have joy. Jesus, before He went to the cross, prayed that we would have joy. Back in John chapter 17, I want to notice another thing He prayed for, beginning in verse 14. Jesus prayed to His Father, I have given them Thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. 
Sanctify them. The word sanctify means to set them apart. Make them holy. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Here's the second thing that Jesus prayed for his church. That his church would be holy. Jesus prayed for that. I don't know about you, but I hear a lot of negativism and condemnation and criticism, you know, about emphasis on holy living. But Jesus prayed that we would be holy. There's, you know, all of us, every one of us that are saved battle with our sinful nature. We battle with our flesh. And the flesh doesn't always want to do the right thing. We have this struggle. Galatians says it's like a battle, a struggle that goes on within us. And the flesh wants to have its own way, but God wants us to live separated lives. God wants us to live holy lives. Young person, if you have a parent or a pastor or a Sunday school teacher or youth work, whoever, that encourages you to live a holy life, you ought to be thankful to that because that's God's will. Jesus prayed for that. Jesus prayed that you and I would live holy lives. Look at the language in verse 14. He says, They are not of the world. He said that again in verse 16. They are not of the world. You could could summarize that or paraphrase that and say this with complete accuracy. Jesus prayed for you and He prayed for me that we would not be worldly. Jesus does not want us to live a worldly life. And a matter of fact, in other places in the Bible, in the book of James, for instance, it says... That friendship with the world is enmity with God. If if I'm being a friend of the world, I make myself in opposition to God. And if if it was just me saying that, you could say, well, preacher, you're just biased, you're opinionated, you know, you're just... But it's not me. As a matter of fact, Jesus didn't just say it. He prayed for it. You know, if I could remember this, every time I'm tempted to do something wrong or to say something wrong, or have a bad attitude, or want to dabble in the world, if I could just remember that before He went to Calvary, Jesus talked to His Father, and with me in mind, He prayed that I would not be of the world. It would help us to understand that really separation is better for us. It's God's plan for us. It's God's plan to help us and bless us. And again, I... You know, I don't want to just keep beating this drum, but in our day and age, even churches, even churches, I believe, are compromising for the sake of, you know, reaching people and really giving people what they want rather than what God says we need. Just because we want something doesn't mean that we need that. And what is it really that separates us? What is it that makes us separate? Look in verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You know what sets us apart? It's the word of God. Not just because we have a Bible. Not just because we carry a Bible. But because we try to live by the Bible. If we never live by the Bible, we're not going to want to live like the world. We want to live by the word of God. Look in verse 19. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. What is it that sanctifies us? We're sanctified through the truth by trying to live by the Word of God. As I mentioned this morning, that passage in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Our Our goal in life should be, I want to read this book, and I want to get to know the author of this book, and I want to begin to... Bring the principles of this word, the promises of this past, these past, into my own life that I'm living by the word of God. You know, people criticize us sometimes because, because of our standards, because we try to live by, and they say, well, you're just holier than now. No, we just want to live by the Bible. We, want, we believe that this book is divinely inspired and it is a lamp into our feet, a light into our path, and God will use it to make our lives better lives. So, we, so Jesus prayed, number one, that we would have joy. Number two, Jesus prayed that we would be holy. And I've already referred to this, but I want to look at a third thing Jesus prayed for in verse 17. He says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Jesus prayed about our relationship 
to the Word of God. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy Word is truth. Now I'm going to assume, and I'm not being sarcastic here, but I'm going to assume that most of the people in this church believe that the Bible is true. Most of the people in this church read their Bible on a daily basis, a regular ba- basis. Most of the people want to you know, live by the Word of God. But, and, that's, and that's really God's design or God's plan. I think people look at us and they think, man, you, your guys are kind of over the top. You know, I mean, taking these things so literal, taking these things serious. I believe that's what God intended. I don't believe this is just a book full of suggestions. I believe it's a book full of guidelines and, and commands and promises and principles that God wants us to. To live by. And I believe, it's, I believe it's inspired and I believe it's preserved, eternally preserved. Look at, you know, when verse 14, what, do you, what else would you get out of this when Jesus said, praying to His Father, I have given them Thy Word. The Word that He gave us is the Word of God. He's given us His Word. And so we ought to live by the Word of God. We need to, you know, we ought to, we ought to get, we really need a revolution, I think, among believers to get back to the Bible. You know, someone mentioned uh, to me today the importance of, you know, iron sharpening iron, us talking about the things of God together and encouraging each other in our spiritual growth. And there, there's, you can never have too much of that, really, because we want to grow in grace. I appreciated this, the emphasis on reading that and memorizing that verse of Scripture. That's a wonderful verse of Scripture, by the way. Did you pick that Scripture out or whoever did? It's a great... I want to preach on that verse. It's, it's, just a, it's a tremendous verse of Scripture. And, but we need to... You know, wherewithal... The psalmist said, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. So we're to be... Jesus prayed for me one day. And you say, well, you weren't there. No, but I was included in that prayer. And He prayed that I would have the joy of the Lord in my life. And He prayed that I would live a holy life. And He prayed that I would live according to the Word of God. Jesus prayed that. By the way, if I were to decide, oh, I'm just going to neglect the Bible. Or if I were to decide, I'm I'm just going to quit trying to live a holy life. If I were to decide, you know what I would be doing? I'd be saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to purposefully do something that's contrary to G- what Jesus prayed for me. And I am far from perfect. And I think all of us are. I mean, compared to what God's standard is, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're far from perfect. But I say, if Jesus prayed that prayer for me, I want it to be fulfilled in my life. So He prayed about our joy. He prayed that we'd be holy. He prayed about a relationship with truth. The fourth thing I'd like to mention, and by the way, just so you know, we're well into the sermon, really. I mean, we only have 37 more of these to go. The fourth thing he prayed about in verse 18, notice it. Notice what Jesus prayed. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. Jesus prayed about our purpose. Jesus prayed about us fulfilling the same purpose. Just like the Father sent Jesus into the world. Aren't you glad that the Father sent Jesus into the world? To do what? To seek and to save the people that are lost. To try to reach, to reach. To leave the 99 and go after that one and bring them in. And he said, as the Father hath sent me into the world. Jesus said this. He prayed this. He said, have I sent them into the world? So he prayed about our purpose. That we would be, we would be involved, engaged in this great work of reaching people that he was involved in. Our purpose should be his purpose. Now all of us are different. We don't all have the same Spiritual gifts, we don't have the same opportunities, we don't have the same experience. But every one of us that name the name of Christ, every one of us that belong to the Lord, every one of us in the Lord's churches ought to have the same purpose that He has. You know, I know there are people in our church that probably think, well, certain people, you know, they ought to be busy about reaching people, but not so much me. But I think all of us, Jesus prayed this. He didn't pray this for a select group of His believers. He prayed this for all of us, that we would have this purpose, that we would, as Luke 14 says, compel them to come in. 
that his house would be full. I was encouraged today just to hear people talking about evangelism and th- going after people and going door to door, things of that nature, because Jesus prayed for that. You know, I could, if I were to decide, okay, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through life and I'm going to love the Lord, but I'm not ever going to give out a gospel track. I'm never going to invite somebody to church. I'm never going to give my testimony. I'm never going to try to engage a person in, in a gospel conversation. If I were to say that, what I'm saying is I'm, I'm purposefully doing something contrary to what Jesus prayed in this passage. Is that right or wrong? Absolutely. All of us ought to be committed to this great purpose of reaching people with the gospel. Jesus prayed for that. Jesus prayed that his churches would be joyful assemblies. Jesus prayed that his churches would be separated and seeking to live holy lives. Jesus prayed that his churches would be committed to truth. Trying to live by the Word of God. Focusing on the Bible. Jesus prayed that His churches would have the same purpose that He had. To reach people with the Gospel. And then, another thing that Jesus prayed for. Down in verse 21, it says, and we're skipping some. They, that they may be one. Jesus prayed that we would be in unity. That they may be one. As Thou, Father, art in me. And I in thee, that they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Jesus prayed that his churches would be in harmony. His churches would be uh, in unity. And with what ultimate goal? The last part of verse 21, that the world may believe. It's similar to that John chapter 13 prayer, you know, that Jesus prayed, or that Jesus talked about, about loving one another, or John 15, excuse me. So, and by the way, he's not talking about some kind of ecumenism there that we're, you know, that we're going to go, we're going to join hands with people that don't even believe the Bible. He's, he wants his churches to be united. He wants his churches to be in agreement. Our love for him, our love for the truth, our love for each other have a common purpose. And that's why it's so harmful you know, when you have strife in a church. That's why it's so harmful that you have discord in a church. As a matter of fact, I, when I, anytime I think about this matter of unity, I think about that strong warning in Proverbs 6. Six things does the Lord hate, yea, seven are abomination unto Him. And one of them is he that soweth discord among the brethren. God frowns upon that. We ought to be in unity. We ought to be in one accord. We're every, every local body, every assembly ought to be ought to be in unity. And, and you know, Satan is the, the master at causing division. He came to steal and to kill and destroy. And he's the master at doing that. And you have to work at this. But I, I thank God I don't see any sign in this church of discord. And there shouldn't be. We, we, you know, and here's the way the devil works. He works, does this way in friendships. He does this way in families. He does this way in churches. You know, he tries to accentuate something, this minor thing that we may not see eye to eye on when we may agree on, you know, 95 other things or 100 other things. That's the way the day, because he, he looks to divide because he, he wants, you know, he, his kingdom, that's what his kingdom is about, about dividing. So Jesus prayed that we would be in unity. You know, I, unfortunately, I have seen situations in churches and we've have actually had one or two of them in our church over the years where there would be this discord or division. And, and really, it's never over doctrine. It's, usually, it's never been, to my knowledge, over doctrine. It's usually over, you know, someone didn't, it didn't happen the way a person wanted it to happen. They didn't have their way or whatever. And it's a sad thing because, listen, Jesus prayed. When He could be praying about a lot of things, when He's on the threshold of going to the Garden of Gethsemane and to Calvary. He could have prayed about a lot of things. But this is what he prayed for. He prayed that his churches would be unified. He preaches that his churches would be in unity. And so we, we ought to work for it. You know, so does unity just happen automatically? No. I think of the verse that Paul wrote to the Ephesian church when he said, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. In the bond of peace. You know what endeavor means? It means you have to work at it. Always working at it and keeping that. And when I think about this church, I think about 
churches in general, but this church is celebrating this anniversary this year, the anniversary of its founding and rejoicing in the goodness and the way God has been faithful, that we ought to always be committed to our church being what the Lord wants it to be. And one thing He wants it to be, He wants it to be unified. He wants us to be in unity together. So Jesus prayed that we would have joy. And that's not just about a personality. You know, it's not just about whether a person's positive or negative. It's about having the joy of the Lord in our life. And Jesus prayed that we would be holy, that we would deal with sin, that we would not allow sin to have its way in our life. Jesus prayed that we would be true to the Word of God, that truth would guide us, the principles of truth would guide us. Jesus prayed about our purpose, that it's not just about us. It's not just about our fellowship, though we have good fellowship. It's not just about us getting together. It's about doing all we can to reach other people with the gospel. Jesus prayed that, our, that we would be unified, that we would be working together. And I want to be a part of the answer to pr- Jesus praying this. And then just, Jesus prayed about another thing. Look in verse 24. He said, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. Jesus prayed about our eternal home. He prayed, he prayed with anticipation that one day we're going to be with Him. We have heaven to look forward to. Can I tell you today, Jesus wants us to be with Him. You know, um, I, I said, stood before a family, I mentioned this this morning, just a couple of days ago, that had lost a loved one. A loved one that had a good testimony. They professed to know Christ. They professed to, you know, to love the Lord. And I said, for us, you know, this is a sad time. It is a sad time. For us, we grieve and we mourn sometimes at the loss of a loved one. But I said, you know, look at, from looking from heaven's point of view, He wants to get us there with Him. He wants us to be there with Him. Matter of fact, you know, the Bible says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of one of His saints. And Jesus in this prayer, praying before He goes to the cross, is praying for those who will be saved, those who will become His followers. And He prayed that we would be there with Him. And I just want to tell you today, maybe you're sitting here this evening and you're not saved or you're not sure you're saved. Nothing means more to the God of creation, the God of of eternity. Nothing means more to God than for you to be with Him in heaven one of these days. And I know that people go through life and they wonder, Does anybody really care? Does God really care? And I want to tell you, God cares about you so much that He sent His Son to die on the cross for you, that you could be saved, that you could have eternal life, that you would be in heaven. And you know, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 2 that who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. And this is not a message, really, an evangelistic message or a message to preach the gospel to unsaved people. But if you're here tonight and you're not saved, young person or older person. It doesn't matter. If you're not saved, God wants you to go to heaven. You know, I I mentioned that verse earlier, that a verse that's really been an important part of my life, that John 10, 10, the thief cometh, but for to steal and to kill and destroy. But Jesus said, I'm come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. That's the, the first The first sermon that I ever preached to an adult congregation was John chapter 10 and verse 10. The thief cometh but for to steal and to kill and destroy, but I'm come that you might have life, have it more abundantly. That was, just just so you know, the first sermon I ever preached was to a group of small children. I'm not really a children's speaker, but I preached to a bunch of kids on this subject from Paul's letter to the Thessalonican church that He will come with flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. <laughs> so, it's a true story. <laughs> I'm, not a, I'm not a children's worker, I'll tell you. <laughs> God wants us to be in heaven with Him. It's going to be a wonderful thing. Heaven's going to be a wonderful place. Amen. My mother... My mother has been in heaven for, for many years. I look forward to reunion with loved ones in heaven. But more than that, we look forward to being with our Lord and being out of this world. But Jesus prayed about our eternal home. 
Jesus prayed about our joy. Jesus prayed that we'd live holy lives. Jesus prayed that we'd be people of the truth. Jesus prayed that we would have the same purpose He has. Jesus prayed that we'd be unified and Jesus prayed about our being with Him one day. And then one last thing I want to mention that Jesus prayed for. Look in verse 26. And Jesus says in this prayer, And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Think about those words. Jesus prayed that the love wherewith the Father had loved Him, the love that the Father had for Jesus may be in us, and I in them, Him in us. Jesus prayed that we would be secure in His love. That we would know that just as much as the Father loved the Son, God loves us. Isn't that an amazing thing? Now, I don't know what that means to you, but it means a great deal to me to know how much that God loves us. The same love the Father had for Jesus, He has for His children. He wants us to abide in that love. And if you'd have asked me 30 years ago, 35 years ago, um, that after all these years, all these years of service and years of you know, studying and preaching and all that, if the love, the love that God has for me would mean as much to me today, I might have said, I don't really know. I mean, I can't really relate to that. But I want to tell you today, I am as, I am as grateful today that God would love me. I am as amazed today that God would love me as I've ever been in my life. Isn't it an amazing thing that God loves me? God, Jesus prayed. Jesus prayed that you, would be, you and I would be secure in the love of the Father and know that He cares about us and loves us. I'll tell you, in reality, and as, and as Bible believers, we believe in the eternal security of the believer. We believe that once a person saved, they're eternally saved. We believe it because the Bible teaches us. Now, I know that there are a few isolated verses that may be taken and as proof texts and try to prove that you can lose your salvation. But the overwhelming evidence of the Bible is that once you're saved, you're eternally saved. And no man can take you out of the Father's hand. We are sealed by the Spirit of God until the day of redemption. The Bible is very clear about this. We, we belong to Him. We are secure in Him. And, and so we're grateful for that. But I'll tell you, it's just amazing to me Today, just to know that God's love is so powerful and so meaningful and so important in our life. And I really believe that sometimes as God's people, as God's people, we can kind of get into a rut or a snare or a trap of feeling like somehow well, God doesn't love me as much as He did, or I've, I've failed in this way, therefore God doesn't care about me. I want to tell you, that's just not true. Amen. God loved me, you know, as, Rome, as Paul wrote to the Romans, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God, God loved me when I was a stubborn, rebellious, prideful, wicked, selfish, blasphemous, ungodly person, God loved me. And He doesn't love me any less today. He loves His children. And God cares about you. Now when Jesus, again, I said in the beginning, and I'm going to wrap this up. In the beginning I said, one of the things that makes His prayer so remarkable to me is who prayed it. That it was Jesus' prayer. And like I said, Jesus, when Jesus prays for something, we can believe that it is the will of God. And that, and, that, and that God's will, God wants His will to be done. But it's also amazing when we think about when He prayed it. No, nothing to me, I don't think, um, reveals any more significantly how much God cares about us than to think that on the verge of going to Calvary, He prayed this for you. He prayed this for you. 
He prayed this for me. When he could have been considering and thinking about and preparing for taking upon his own body the sins of the whole world, that him who knew no sin would made to be sin. He could have been thinking about a lot of things, but you know what he's thinking about? He was thinking about you. And he was thinking about me. And he was praying. He was praying that one day we would become his. One day we would be in heaven with him. And that while we're on this journey, that we would be people who took the Bible seriously. And we would be people who walked in the Word of God. And we'd be people who had the purpose of trying to reach people with the gospel. And we'd be people who had the joy of the Lord in our life and found joy not just in getting our way, but in serving other people. And we'd be people that were grounded in the Father's love for us. That's what He prayed for us. And you know what? If He prayed that for us, we ought to want these things to be true in our life. Does that make sense to you? And so tonight... As we've emphasized these things, taken directly from the prayer of Jesus. Maybe there's something you're thinking, that's that's something that really is not being seen in my life. Maybe I don't have the purpose that I should. Maybe I've not embraced living a holy life the way I should. Maybe I've been, maybe I've been negative or critical and the joy of my salvation is not there. Tonight would be a good night. This is just, it's just the way I look at it. Tonight would be a good night to say, Lord, I want this prayer that you prayed for me to be true in my life. I want this prayer to be a reality in my life. I want to have this purpose. I want to be secure in the Father's love. I want to quit doubting whether God cares. I want to, and you know what? All that is is faith in what God says in His Word. And if you're here tonight... And you're not saved. But you want to be saved. Tonight would be a great night. A great night to be born again. Wouldn't it? Tonight would be a wonderful night to say, I want Jesus Christ in my life. And to you young people, I just want to say, I have a special burden for young people. You know, I I just want to see young people follow the Lord and not be drawn into the world and the things of this world. And you know what? Tonight would be a good night just to say, Lord, I want you to have your way in my life. Amen. Could we stand together, please, for a word of prayer? Everyone standing. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed this evening, just a moment, I'm going to pray and Pianists will be playing. But tonight, would you think about your life? And would you think about it in these terms? I, wanna, I want the prayer that Jesus prayed for me to be fulfilled, to be answered in my life. I certainly don't want to do anything or believe anything or act in any way that would be contrary to the prayer that Jesus prayed. I would urge you to do that tonight. There at your seat, here at this altar, however you feel like the Lord would have you to. Our Father, as we pray tonight, we think about this holy moment when Jesus prayed for us, prayed for us prior to His walk toward Gethsemane and toward the cross. Lord Jesus, thank You for praying for us. Praying for us that we would have joy in our life. We know that sometimes we've let things come into our life that have hindered our joy and stolen our joy. But Lord, we thank You for praying for us that we would live holy lives. And we know, Lord, there are times that we've not been true to what we know to be Your will for our life. For all these things that You prayed, Lord, thank You for praying for us. Praying about our understanding and of the love of the Father. 
in our life. Lord, we thank You for that. And Father, we want this prayer to be answered in our lives. I pray tonight, if there's one here that's not saved, the Lord, that the Spirit of God and the Word of God would work in their hearts, that they would want to come and receive Christ. God, we pray for that. We pray for the church, Lord, as we think about this church and this month of recognition of the faithfulness of God over these years. Thank You for what You've done and are doing. May this church, Lord, may this church be an answer to the prayer that Jesus prayed. With our heads bowed this evening and our eyes closed,